Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome to Uncommon Church. We are so glad to see you here this morning. Now, you might wonder, why is the preacher coming in on a bicycle? And here's my answer. I have no real reason for doing this, other than it seemed like fun. And I think we need to have a little more fun in church, if you know what I'm saying. So, do I have a reason for doing this? No, other than it makes you smile. And if you're smiling, I'm smiling. And if I'm smiling and you're smiling, we're having fun in church. Yeah, somebody! The funny thing was, after seeing it in first service, the worship team said, I think you should ride down the stairs, because that would be more fun. So I said, no, I'm not gonna ride down the stairs, because then I'll break my neck, and then you'll have to play back first service in second service. Come on, somebody. The kids still got it. What? Not going to lie. Somewhere around step two and three, I didn't know if I was going to make that. But I figured they'd just play back first service while I was getting my legs set at the hospital. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah, you sound good. I stole that bike from a kid, so I better hold on to that. Thanks for letting me borrow your bike. So how's everybody doing? I'm out of breath. I should have worked out a little before I exercised in church. That is going to come back to bite me in the rear. Listen, I want to talk about faith. Right? Doesn't it have a lot to do with riding in on a bicycle with balloons on it? You're going to find out how it does in a minute. Because faith is one of these things that's like, yes, I have faith that God is real and he's the savior of my soul. Do you? Because a lot of times when we face trouble in life, trouble in marriage, trouble in health, trouble in finances, trouble in the world, we get into fear and we freak out. So today, gosh, I wish I'd stop panting. Today, I want to talk about how to have faith. Now, the Bible says, the writer of Hebrews said in eleven six, it is impossible to please God without faith. But too often, we live our Christian lives faithless. We say we have faith, but we don't actually live from a position and a place of faith. So the deal is, it is impossible to please God without faith. And here's, look at the second part of the verse. God rewards those that seek him that diligently seek him, that sincerely seek him. So there's a reward for having faith. So I want to receive a reward from the Father. And that reward comes through having faith. Now some of you are like, bro, life is tough right now. I get it. And I don't know about you if you're a super faith person. For me personally, it's so much easier to respond in fear than in faith. I get it. When you look at the economy and politics and the corona and the whole thing, it's so much easier that we, our first reaction is fear. But we as believers are rewarded, celebrated. The Lord puts a pin on our, a medal on our shirt when we respond in faith. Because God is a good father and he rewards good behavior. So with a lot of kids in church today, because obviously we've got some kid things that are a little bit less kiddy right now, you know, we've got just the you kids, kindergarten through sixth grade, but toddlers are here with us. Listen, kiddos, mom and dad reward good behavior. If you're good for the next 26 and a half minutes, I will reward you for your good behavior. God rewards good behavior in his kids. In fact, when we respond in faith and not fear, it triggers a response from God that he wants to reward us. Now, the funny thing, I don't know why people think that si- sipping water will help your lungs have more air, <laughs> but I am very grateful. The disciples traveled with Jesus and they didn't get what you guys are about to get because they had faith. They saw Jesus perform miracles. They saw Jesus walk on water. They saw Jesus multiply food. In fact, Jesus sent the disciples out and they saw blind eyes open. They saw miracles in their ministry through Jesus' name. They had faith. But what happened is they started jockeying for position. 
yeah, but who has the most faith? Who has the best faith? Who can write a faith book? Who can have the faith conference? Am, am I the greatest of the faith people? And Jesus responded to the disciples in Matthew 18, 1. He said, the, the disciples said, who's the greatest? And please say it's me. And Jesus said, you're totally missing the point. I need a child for this illustration. Rylan, would you help me out? Come on up here, buddy. Run as fast as you can up here to your mark. So Jesus got a little child from the crowd and he held up a little child and he put him on his brown tape mark right there. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sin and become, why are they laughing? I, know. I don't know. I guess you're just such a good looking kid. Unless you turn from your sin and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Do I need to read that again? Unless you turn from your sin and become like a little child, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven? That's really harsh of Jesus. Anyone who will become as humble as a child will become the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, buddy. You did a great job for standing there. So the deal is this. Jesus is like, you disciples are trying to become the best. If you want to get to the top, you got to go to the bottom. Because the most humble are the ones that go to the top. And some people are like, what do you exactly mean I won't go to heaven? I don't know, but I think he might mean it literally. No, because if I raise my hand at the end of the service and I pray the prayer, that's all I have to do. Is it though? Because Jesus said it's more than just a simple prayer. You have to live a faith like a child. He didn't say you need to be childish in your faith. He said you need to have faith like a child. You have to change. You have to stop sinning. You have to turn to the Lord and believe by faith and then live out your Christian faith humble like a little child. So I find that so many grown-up Christians, so many super mature Christians, they've overcomplicated their faith. And they're looking at all the end times and they're figuring out raptures and tribulations and they're figuring out new Jerusalems and they're making all these Facebook posts and making everybody crazy. <laughs> so we respond in fear, not faith. And we've overcomplicated something that's supposed to be very simple. Now, I said make your faith simple, don't make it easy. You should never want easy faith. You want simple, childlike faith, but not easy. Because when I read my Bible cover to cover, it's not that easy. If you do it right, it'll kill you. So real faith is going to cost you everything, but it doesn't have to be overcomplicated and confusing and fearful. It should just be a simple faith like that of a child. So today, we're going to look at a few attributes and qualities of a child and how we can apply that to our walk of faith. So the very first thing that I could just jump off here with kids in general are super optimistic. Like, everything is amazing, everything is fun, kids are Tigger, adults are Eeyore. Like, everything is just like, yeah, let's make a game of everything, and let's have fun. And they, they bring all this wonder and awe and excitement and whimsy to everything they do. Because there's nothing serious. It's like, well, Billy, I've got to pay taxes. And they're like, let's play the taxes game. You know, like, everything is a game to kids. Where, why is everything so serious to grown-ups? We should ride into church on a bicycle with balloons on it just because it's fun and because we don't smile enough. In first service, I said, do you know why I'm riding the bike in? Because it's hard to watch somebody ride a bicycle with balloons on it and not smile as I rode past somebody that was like this. <laughs> so we're going to play the video from second service because you guys were smiling. We need to live a life, a Christian life, of hope and wonder and joy and awe. Next thing I've learned from kids. Kids come out of the oven without prejudice. They don't have any hatred. They don't care what skin color you are, what country you're from, what language you speak. They don't care. They just, you want to play? I want to play. Let's play. Why can't Christians be more like that? I don't care what language you're from. I don't care where you're from. I don't care. Listen, can we just play? We need to have a love for everyone always. Hatred, prejudice, line separation, that's learned behavior. Bad parents, bad grandparents, bad culture. So we need to be the kind of Christian that says, I love everybody always. Third thing I've noticed about kids, super curious. 
Kids are always asking a million questions. It's cute with your grandkids and your nieces and your nephews. With your own kids, it's just your answer is, I don't know, just why, just shut up. Because kids are always asking questions. They're, they're, they're very inquisitive. What does this do? What does that do? How high is that? Can I jump up there? Can we go there? Can I eat that? Why don't we read our Bibles like that? What does this do? How can I have the fruit of the Spirit? I wanna operate in the power of the gifts of the Spirit. I wanna love people. Can I walk on water? What does the book say? Jesus said, you'll do the things that I did. No, you'll do greater things. Where's that curiosity for the things of God? Where, why aren't we learning? Do you know what that, disciple means disciplined student. The disciples were students of the rabbi Jesus. We are students. We should be wanting to learn and curious and asking questions and studying the word. I found this blog when I I Google searched for kids questions and it's a mom and dad that have a blog. They've got a bunch of kids and they, they, they wrote down all the times their kids said super embarrassing things in restaurants like out loud, right? And it, you would think it starts with, but it's not really the scary ones like, why is the sky blue? And are we there yet? And uh, do I have to eat all my veggies? No, no, it would be more like a conversation when mom was pregnant and the other older kids were talking and looking at mom's belly like, mom, how did I get into your belly? And dad, what did you have to do with all this? And he's like, my favorite thing in the world. So, and then the other kid spoke up and like, how did I get out of your belly? Or questions like, Dad, did you fart again? <laughs> or you're at the grocery store and the kid's like, Mom, can we please have the cereal in a box from the top shelf and not the bag from the bottom shelf? If kids know what I'm talking about. <laughs> or this is my favorite. Mom, is that lady pregnant or fat like the other one? <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that you're inquisitive, but stop asking so many questions. Kids ask a million questions, they're curious. When did we get so mature in our faith we stopped asking questions and searching the scriptures for the answers? Jesus said you need to have faith like a child. You need to be curious about the kingdom of God. You need to ask questions about his power, about his love, about his kingdom come on earth, which then leads to the next thing, kids are teachable. They don't come out knowing math and science and history. They they, they like to learn. (laughs) When did we stop learning? But I will say this, nobody likes a know-it-all. <laughs> like, be humble, be teachable, be hungry for more information. Speaking of hungry, kids are always hungry. They wanna eat all the time for some reason. You think once a day would be enough? No, no, more than that. Kids are always hungry. When did we stop becoming so desperately hungry in our Christian faith? Like, no, I eat once a week for an hour and 10 minutes. That's all you're gonna eat? Well, I'm gonna skip next week and just watch the live stream. If you're at home and sick, that wasn't a slap at y'all. That was more a slap at the American church in general for not being hungry. We've got people at home sick today, you know, just monitoring health situations. Speaking of which, I don't know that we did the announcement before, but this is a completely touchless service, after service, please, no high fives, no fist bumps, no hugs. Keep your social distance until you're on somebody else's insurance policy. (laughs) We should always hunger for more and never be satisfied. Like for me, it would be hard to ever like stop eating chocolate ice cream. It's not always like, would you like more? The answer is always gonna be yes. Like has anybody ever said, no, I don't want more chocolate ice cream. We should have that insatiable hunger for the things of God. Do you want more worship? Yes, sing another song. Can I preach another longer sermon? Yes, give me another verse and another funny story. Can, can, can I come to Wednesday night prayer? Yes, for an hour, we'll press into the power and presence of God. You wanna serve on a dream team to save people, serve people? Yes, yeah. let me serve on two teams. You wanna give in this offering? Yes, you know what I find about kids? Kids have this extremely funny dichotomy. They're very, very selfish, but then sometimes they're very, very generous. Like it's sometimes they're like, no, you can't have that water bottle I was playing with. But other times they're like, mommy, look at the poor person holding the sign on the side of the street. We should give them our house. Like they they swing wildly from super stingy to super generous. I want us to be super generous in our walk with God that we would reach out to people and love on them well. The next thing is this, kids are brave. They're risk takers. They believe they can fly so they jump off the top bunk until they break something. (laughs) Because kids are brave. 
When did we as Christians stop becoming so brave and taking risks for the Lord? The very last thing that Jesus said before he went back up into heaven, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, the Great Commission, Jesus said, hey, church, go into all the world and preach the good news. But too many Christians won't even go to Kroger and tell somebody, God bless you. Like, forget having a passport and going to the nations. Easy, Lord, with your, like, overdoing it in the Great Commission. I'm going to treat that like a suggestion, not a commandment. If you're an American Christian and you don't have a passport, you're telling the Lord, Matthew 28, 19 is not for me. It's COVID. We can't fly anywhere anyway. So get a passport now. So whenever all this nonsense is over, you're first in line for the next missions trip. How about that? I've had to cancel so many trips this year. I was going to have some fun. We were going to take the gospel to the nations. So whenever this is lifted, we're going to get our passports and take the gospel to the nations. Amen? Amen? We need to learn to take risks again. Remember, Jesus held up a little child. He said, I want your Christian faith not to be childish, but to be childlike, which means take risks for the Lord, right? Amen? Be like, well, I just don't know. I don't know if I feel safe or I don't know that the Lord would protect me. Listen, a ship is extremely safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships were created for. Christians are very safe in the American church, but that's not what they were created for. And think about it this way. Kids have to be risk takers just to learn to walk. Like they're standing up, they're holding on to mom and dad's fingers, they hold on to the coffee table. But at some point, the kid needs to face the living room, let go of the coffee table and walk and take a risk. And you're like, yeah, but I might fall. Every kid falls. Do you just, when, when the little kid's learning to walk and falls, you're like, hey, stupid kid, you should have, I mean, no, that's what CPS and the police are for. Loving families, they pick up the little kid. And they say, you're going to be okay. I'm going to teach you. Let's keep moving. Peter took a huge risk. Jesus was walking on water, and he's like, hey, anybody want to come for a walk? And Pete's like, you guys don't want to walk on freaking water? I will. Jake, let me come to you. And then instead of responding in faith, he looked at the waves, he looked at life, he looked at taxes, he looked at COVID, and he got full of fear. And you're like, yeah, Peter sank. Yeah, but then Jesus reached down, picked him back up, and they both stood on the water, and they both walked back to the boat on the water, and then Peter stepped back into the boat. Wouldn't you rather be a wet boat sitter, a wet water walker than a dry boat sitter? Like, take a risk for the Lord. Boy, they could have used that on Instagram, but since I botched it, they won't be able to use that one anymore. Kids dream big. Like kids want to be astronaut, president, ballerina, and invent the next Nike, all on like the day they graduate from school because they have huge dreams. What kid grows up, like the, when I grow up, I want to be addicted to drugs. When I grow up, I want to be uh, anxious and full of fear. I, whoa, 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 whoa. I want to be in debt up to my eyeballs. When I uh, grow up, I want to be terrible at relationships and blow through all of my family until nobody likes me anymore. I want to grow up and be sad. Kids don't dream like that. And if we're going to grow up and have childlike faith, we need to dream big things with the Lord. Like, Lord, what could we do for you? I, I dream of stadiums being filled up with unsaved people that come to faith in Jesus. I, I, I dream of, of, of eyes uh, being healed of blindness and legs being healed of lameness. And, and I dream of a church that's full of power and faith and wisdom. I dream of a childlike church that takes God at his word and they dream up big things. They believe big. The problem is the more mature we get in the faith, the smaller our God gets until we fit him into a little human-sized box. And we're like, okay, God, you stay in that little box that I can control. I'll open you for 65 minutes on a Sunday and then we'll close you back up again. Church family, we need to have faith like a child and dream big and stop limiting what God can do in our lives. Like we need to start dreaming big dreams for the Lord. Speaking of believing God, kids, they come out not really knowing much. So they're kind of dumb as a box of rocks. And if you tell them that Santa Claus is real, they believe you, right? If you tell them about Tooth Fairy, they believe you. If you tell them that Pastor Brad is really funny, they believe you. My kids will tell you the reality is he's not. Why? Children take their parents at their word. When did we become so mature in our Christian faith that we don't take the Lord at his word anymore? 
We read the Bible and like, hmm, nice allegory about something that happened 2,000 years ago with some Jews in the Middle East. But that doesn't apply to my life in the modern world. No, no. Childlike faith takes the Father at his word. And we look to the word of God as a daily outline for our faith for the whole day. We trust God at his word. You're like, well, that, that creates kind of a weird codependency. Oh, totally, and it should. You're using your Christianity like a crutch. No, I'm using my Christianity like a wheelchair because I am completely dependent on the Lord Jesus and on his word. I am dependent for him for a roof over my head, for clothes on my back, food in my belly, and a smile on my face. I am completely dependent on Jesus. That's what I'm trying to get you guys to. We get so dependent on ourselves that we don't have faith that the Lord is the one who provides and protects. And here's the, here's the, the crazy thing. Think of, you don't see like a six-year-old going to work in the coal mine for 40 or 50 hours a week to put the mortgage, get paid. But that's the way we treat our Christian life. We trust in our own work and not in the work of the Lord. We don't trust in our Father in heaven to provide. Jesus addressed this in Luke chapter 11, verse 11. He said, listen, hey, you fathers, you guys, are, you're good dads. And if your kids ask for a fish, you're not gonna give them a snake because snakes are awful. And if you give your kid a snake, then you have to burn the house down. So if your kids ask for something, you, if they ask for scrambled eggs in the morning, you're not gonna give them scrambled eggs with scorpion mixed in there because you're a good parent. And if you sinful people know how to give a good, good gift to your children, how much more is the heavenly father gonna give the Holy Spirit to whoever asks? So remember, we're growing in our faith like little children. And if a good earthly parent knows how to take care of and provide for their kids, how much more is our heavenly father gonna meet all of our needs? We have to learn to trust God to be our provider. Now here's a little pro tip. Jesus wasn't talking about food and clothing and jobs and roof over your head. He was talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord has given the gift of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to the church and we've left that gift unopened. Children don't leave gifts unopened. Children are amazing at opening gifts. They tear the package apart, they tear it, and they figure it out, and they shake it, and they, we should be more engaged with learning how to operate in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, some people, they hear this message, they see me riding around on a bicycle in the balloons, and like, dude, just chill. Like, okay, you clearly went on vacation last week, you were at the beach, your nose got burned because it's so long and sticks out from under the head of your ball cap while you sat at the beach. We were here working. We were wearing masks. Like, I'm a little stressed right now. Being in the real world means you gotta be a grown-up. Life is hard. And I went through a terrible marriage or I went through a bad work and finance thing. I've been kicked on my butt. I, I, I get it. Kids fall down all the time. Good parents pick them back up, kiss their boo-boo, and get them back moving down the road again. All kids get hurt. You know the funny thing when a kid gets hurt? four-year-old learning to ride the bike and fall over, skin their knee. And dad notices, so he comes running over. Like, no four-year-old gets up with blood pouring down his knee, like, dad, easy, freak. Like, I don't need you right now. No, when a kid gets hurt, they're like, daddy, pick me up and hold me. <laughs> because we're so sad that a, a kid's not going to run the other direction. They're going to run to their father. Speaking of running to their father, I am so sad. I have three kids, and they're all grown now. And as I was writing this message this week, I remember when my kids used to hear me pull into the driveway, beep the car, boop, boop, and then my kids, no matter what they were doing, whether they were eating or playing or napping or watching TV, when they heard boop, boop, they would come, Dad's home, and come running to the door. My, my son would take a, a running leap and just jump into my arms and he was like three or four, big hugs, and Dad's home. When did we become so spiritually mature that we don't run to our father and jump into his arms anymore? We show up like a teenager, 10 minutes late for church, just looking at our phone, totally disengaged with what's going on in the room. Are we that mature that we don't need to run to our father's arms and have him pick us up and hold us? Listen, this is a simple message about having childlike faith. But you're like, I came here for some meat and you're giving me milk, bro. Like, I am so mature, I don't need to hear about childlike faith anymore. Listen, for the sake of some folks that may never have heard this before, this is a life and death message. What? 
Remember the first verse we read from Matthew that Jesus said, the people that don't have faith like a child will never experience the kingdom of God? He doubled down in Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Parents brought their children to Jesus so that he could touch them and bless them. Jesus was a good rabbi, clearly had the power and presence of the Lord. So the parents would bring their kids to the rabbi so that he could touch them and bless them. But this bothered the disciples. So they scolded, get those stupid kids away from the king of the universe. What's the matter? So Jesus in verse 14, he saw this, he saw what was happening and he was angry with the disciples. He said, hey, 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 let the children come unto me. Don't stop them. Why? Because the kingdom of God belongs to those children. That's actually not what he said. The kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth. Anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. And then like a loving father, he took the kids in his arms. He put his hands on their heads and he blessed them. We, church family, need to receive the kingdom of God like a little child. Now remember, I said childlike, not childish. So one thing about children, that from the moment they're conceived, their cells are multiplying, they're growing, they're born, these little bitty nine pound things, and then they're just they're constantly growing and growing and growing. We as Christians, should constantly be growing too. We should have the faith of a child, meaning we should constantly be maturing, constantly growing. And here's my problem. Kids that were born into Christian families and raised in a Christian home and went to church every Sunday, at some point, that child, that teenager, needs to make their faith personal, not their parents. Because I grew up in a Christian home, but I didn't really surrender and believe for myself, like an adult faith, until I was about 16 years old. So here's the deal. We need to mature and grow and make our faith our own. That's part of having that childlike faith is that we mature and we make our faith our own. So here's a warning to those of you that grew up in a Christian home. I'm asking you, is your faith actually your own? Because the longer I do this, the more Christians I meet, they're adults on the outside, but they're like babies on the inside. And there's no strength, there's no depth on the inside. And when they face trouble in health, trouble in relationships, trouble in life, trouble in finance, their faith crumbles. See, we are called to have faith like a little child, which means that we need to grow and we need to mature. And for so many Christians, it's time to grow up. It's time to mature. That's what children do, is they're constantly growing and maturing. So church family, if you're here today, if you're watching online, it's time for God's sake, grow up. And I remind you of the first verse I read 20 minutes ago, Matthew chapter 18 and verse three, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So step one in this walk of faith is turning away from sin. You wanna be like a child? Turn away from sin. What I'm noticing is that so many adult, grown-up Christians are weighed down by the pressures of this world. They're weighed down by sin. They're, they're, They're carrying things they're never supposed to carry. And the Lord is like, why don't you give that to me? It's like the very weight of our own sin we carry. Romans chapter six and verse 23 says, the wages of our sin The payment, the price, the weight of our sin is death. But the free gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Kids love to receive gifts. And the older we get, we buy our own birthday presents and we help our kids wrap them so that we get a gift from ourselves. Do you remember when you were a kid, you'd get the presents from your parents and stuff? And then in the mail, there would always be a card from your grandparents. And for some reason, your grandma would stick actual physical dollar bills like in the card. And when you would open that card, you didn't care about the envelope. You didn't care about the card. You just wanted to see money drop out. You know what I'm saying? 
And when you were a kid, did you want to see a $5 bill fall out or a $20 bill? Right? Everybody wants a $20 bill to fall out of their birthday card. Is it, is it anybody's birthday today or maybe this weekend? If it's your birthday today or this weekend, raise your hand up real high. I want to see your hand if it's your birthday. Anybody? No birthdays this week? TJ, your birthday was a couple days ago. Why don't you raise your hand? Anybody else? Okay, where's those cards? Let me see a card. PJ, come here. PJ, I'm going to give you, well, Lene's going to give you a birthday card with $20 in there. So how about that? Lene, I think we could do better than that. If you were born in the month of July, raise your hand. Yeah, hands up. Now you know what you're getting. Oh, now all the hands is going up. Lene, give everybody born in the month of July a birthday card with $20 in it. How about that, somebody? You know what? I feel like we can do better than that. If you were born in the last 365 days, everybody gets a child's birthday card with $20 and go fall out. How about that? Here's, here's what you got to do, though. If you need that money, you keep it. And when I say need, I mean like lunch this afternoon, gas in your tank. But if you don't need it, I want you to hold on to that $20. Put it in your wallet, put it in your purse, put it in your center console. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to tell you when you should give that $20 to somebody. And then you're going to bless them. That happened to me on Friday. I was getting gas on Friday and a, a woman pulled up in an, an older car and, um, and uh, she, she, she just pulled right up and I'm standing there and she rolled her window down and she said, excuse me, sir. And I knew what was coming. So I said, you need someone to help you with gas money. She said, like almost tears welled up. She said, yes. I said, pull your car around, sweetheart. Let me pump your gas. So I put the debit card in there and I pumped your gas, filled it up. Thank God gas is cheap. It's only 21 bucks. But that's what I mean. What if she had a big Suburban and it was empty, right? But that's what I want you to do. If you need it, lunch is on the church. If you don't need it, stick it in your wallet. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to bless somebody. We gave $20 to somebody in first service. And then when they were leaving, they drove around the back of the church, they noticed there was somebody dumpster diving in our dumpsters. This is an hour ago. So they drove right by like, ha ah! No. <laughs> they stopped the car because the Holy Spirit said $20. And got out and talked for like 30 minutes. Came in crying, had this amazing talk with this lady that fell on hard times, was able to give her the $20. So you don't know what opportunities God's gonna open up to you when you do something like that. Was that fun? Hop up on your feet. Oh, you'll get your money when you leave. It'd take too long to give it to you now. <laughs> so if you have not yet gotten your child's birthday card with your 20 bucks, the ushers will give it to you on your way out here in a few minutes. I wanna read one more verse. It comes from Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this because it was a gift from God. So kind of like the $20 birthday card. There's nothing you can do. Just by being born and coming to church today, you got $20. It was a gift. It wasn't a reward for any good thing you've done. You can't boast in it. You just were born, so you got $20. The cross, there's nothing you can boast in that except in the man, Jesus Christ, that loved you so much that he laid down his body and shed his blood so that you could know the Lord Jesus. So I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, <laughs> how can I have my faith be more childlike, more hope, more wonder, more faith, more risk-taking, more joy, more, more, more awe? Ask the Lord this, Lord, am I too mature? Have, have, I, have I let my frown go upside, my, my smile? go upside down and I need to let my frown turn upside down and smile again? Do, do I look like I've been baptized in vinegar? Do, am I a sour puss? Am I so mature? Am I so grown up that I carry the weight of the world? Or do I have a childlike whimsy? Oh, here's another one. Lord, am I too busy to be childlike? Am I just, I'm just so busy. Oh, hey, I want you to come to Wednesday night, worship and pray for an hour. Oh, pastor, I, I'm so busy. I'm, I, I'm being busy and the spouse's job and the kids and the food and the this. You are so busy, you don't have an hour to pray. Maybe you need to sleep an hour less. Wouldn't that be a better use of an hour a week on a Wednesday night? 
Like when did we get so much that we don't want more? Like in a minute, you know we're gonna worship. Some of you are like, oh crap, I forgot about that last worship song and I really wanna go eat lunch. He gave me 20 bucks for lunch. Or wouldn't it be like, oh, I hope they sing two worship songs because I get to spend a few more minutes in his presence. I'm just asking. Think about the Lord's prayer itself. The disciples said, hey, Jesus, teach us how you want us to pray. He said, all right, somebody write this down and tweet this because in 2,000 years, I'm going to help them know how to pray. You ready? Father in heaven, holy is your name. What does the very beginning of that prayer teach us? He is our Father and we are His children. It's a constant reminder that He is our Father in heaven, that He loves us and He is proud of us. And He wants you to come to Him with childlike. Preacher, you don't know me. You don't know my story. You don't know that the things I've done and the things I've seen and I've, I've gotten drunk and I've gotten high and I've looked at porn and I've stolen from my job and I've slept with people I'm not married to. Yeah, my kids make mistakes too. But when my kids blow it, I don't love them any less. When your kids were little and they were playing in the living room and you said don't play in the living room and they knocked the lamp over, yes, you're disappointed, but no, you never stop loving your kid. You go in, you clean up the lamp, you pick them up in your arms, you be like, hey, it's okay, it's okay. You're still amazing and I still love you. So even if you've blown it, God picks you up in his arms today and says, hey, hey, it's okay. Just because you made a mistake doesn't mean I love you any less. God's crazy about you. He wants to reward you for your faith. He wants to pin a medal on your chest so you are brave. You're a risk taker. You're childlike. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I think we need help. (laughs) I need help. I need help to be more childlike in my faith. And I need help to not be childish in my faith. And I need help to love like a child, to be humble like a child, to have faith like a child, to have awe and wonder like a child. God, I I need help. So would you help us this morning? Lord, we started this whole thing by saying, we quoted you. We have to turn from sin and have faith like a child. So Lord, would you help us to turn from sin? Would you help us to turn away from the things that so entangle us and hold us back and give us a childlike purity and innocence in our hearts? Help us, Lord. Lord, help us to receive that gift of eternal life. Help us to tear in to the packaging and understand the kingdom of God in our lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning, and you have not yet turned from your sin, today is your day. Or maybe you turned from your sin years ago, but over the years you've gotten so mature that your heart has grown cold and separated from God. Well, today is your day to lift your hands to the Lord and come running back so that your Father can pick you up and hold you in His arms of love again. He's not mad at you. So I wanna lead you in a prayer to ask God to forgive you of your sin and to receive that gift of eternal life and that you would start your journey of childlike faith. So for some of you, it's the very first time you've ever prayed this prayer in your life and it's gonna change your life forever. For others of you, it's the first time in a long time that you've prayed this prayer. So whether it's the first time or the first time in a long time, if you believe it in your heart, I want you to pray this out loud. Church family, why don't we all Pray it out loud. Even if you're watching at home, pray it out loud. Say, Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I turn from my sin and I make you the Lord of my life. You are my Father. I am your child. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of eternal life. I receive that gift. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help me to have a childlike faith. Help me to trust in you even when it hurts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 
And if you're here this morning and you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, man, I'm so proud of you. You just went from death to life, from sinner to saint. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Here's what we're going to do. If you prayed that prayer for the first time and the first time in a long time, if you're here in the building, reach into the seat back in front of you, and I want you to fill out that Connect card, and then bring it up here to the front and pray with one of our prayer team members that are coming up now. If you're watching online, text the word Jesus to 817-405-2244, and then you're going to get a little auto-response form. Fill that out. Give us your email address, because I want one of our pastors to get in touch with you this week and help encourage you and pray for you in your walk of faith.